Good evening. My name is Paul, and I am a full-blown alcoholic. And I am very glad to be here. And I'm very glad that you're here. Sure would be a big empty room without you. <laughs> and I'm uh, this is an this is an impressive sight. I uh, I'm very impressed with being here. And I, I love the candlelight meeting. Uh, reminds me of uh, my first home groups at uh, particularly Saturday night Canyon Club in Laguna Beach. Uh, we used to drive down to Laguna Beach from uh, we lived in Anaheim. Drove to Laguna Beach so I wouldn't run into anybody I knew. And, uh, continued to go there until I had uh, eventually run into everybody that goes to Laguna Beach so they won't run into anybody they know. <laughs> and we loved the uh, candlelight meetings uh, because it uh, helped protect our my anonymity, and uh, which was very important to me. And I'm very impressed with being asked to be uh, a speaker here tonight. It's just one of my favorite, my favorite uh, roundup, and I, I am impressed to be here. And I, I want to thank Margaret and the committee for asking, asking Max and I both. Max talked at noon today and gave her perverted version of my story. <laughs> which she likes to call the the sober version. Uh, Max admits, though, that. Uh, the uh, Al-Anon is often sicker than the alcoholic, and I like to uh, agree with everything Max says. <laughs> in fact, I, uh, I, I uh, you know, I was so happy to be invited to this meeting that I, I was, I was an out-of-state speaker when I was invited, <laughs> living up in Red. Uh, Redmond, Washington. I was so anxious to speak here that we moved down as close as we could get. And, uh, <laughs> now we're down in Laguna Niguel, where we've wanted to live in that area for ever since I got sober, because we got sober in that area. And um, we've been moving around a lot the last five years. I think we've moved four or five times. And people often ask me, how come you're moving so much? I said, hell, I don't know. I said, I took the third step and completely lost control of my life. <laughs> but uh, I found out what happened is we'd been moving around so I could, we could live close to where I was working. And working was interfering with my program, and so I gave up work. <laughs> so we're not going to move anymore. We're staying right where we are. We love it. We just love being back in the southern part of Southern California. I think that's just terrific. And I love the, the AA here, and uh, glad to be home. I, uh, I was speaking at Al-Anon's. I, I'm, I'm used to being in a meeting. Uh, we didn't see it up in Washington. The meetings were up there. They didn't have a show of hands. I, I like a show of hands. Could we see the hands of all the alcoholics? Could you raise your hands, please? That's terrific. Let's give us a hand. Yeah. That's good. We definitely have a quorum. <laughs> What about the, um, the Alamans? I know there's some Alamans here. I can, I can feel the vibrations. So. <laughs> can we see the hands of the Alamans? You're the ones with the blue badges, in case you don't know who you are. Okay. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, Alamans are easily addicted to compliments. Yes. <laughs> Don't laugh, don't laugh. You should never laugh at the Alamans. No, you shouldn't. The book speaks very kindly of the Alamans. It says, they're not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. Okay. You shouldn't laugh at them because I, I understand there are a few of you people that have a little trouble making this program anyway. And trying to stay sober on just a meetings in the first couple of steps, and uh, you might want to look into that al program. It uh, might be worth you looking into. It's, uh, they've, got our, they've got our whole program. They've got the steps and traditions, and they've got the whole thing. they got our whole program, and they can drink, too. <laughs> Yeah, 
might be just what, what some of you are looking for. <laughs> How about the uh, newcomers? Are you coming at a roundup? You have a show of hands for the newcomers. Thirty days or less since your last drink. Would you raise your hands, please? Just them over there. That's great. That's great. We're glad you're here. We hope you keep coming back. You might as well. <laughs> You just ruined your reputation. <laughs> this is as bad as it gets. There's only one time when it's this bad, and that's uh, when it gets this bad again. And that's when you've been around AA for a while, been sober a while. You're getting to be almost an expert, and find yourself all screwed up, and uh, you get to talking to somebody, and you. They point out to you that the reason you're screwed up is because you're living with another alcoholic, and they tell you to go to Al-Anon. Yeah. Then you can really get insulted. I think they suggest that to you. Uh, the, uh, so we're glad you're here. I, uh, speaking here tonight, I realized uh, it's been a, con- a considerable concern to me that I, uh, a number of you people haven't heard me talk before, but an awful lot of you have heard me talk before. And, this is an important enough occasion to uh, call for an entirely new talk, a new story. <laughs> yeah, that's a big problem, you know, and I, I thought of that. I thought about that a lot. Yeah. But uh, new stories have a high, high price tag. Right? <laughs> wasn't, wasn't sure I'd be back by Easter. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> I didn't know what to do about that. I, got, I gave a lot of thought. I even got to worrying about it. I'd love to worry. I'd love to worry. Uh, in fact, I firmly believe in the positive power of worry. Uh, you worry enough about something, you can hold it back. You can keep it from happening. It doesn't always work, but even if it doesn't work, at least you know by God you gave it your best shot. You know that? <laughs> You didn't just sit there and do nothing and let it happen, you know. You weren't passive about it. You worried real good about it. And uh, I like to worry, and I like to be depressed. I always love being depressed. <laughs> I used to, uh, when I get depressed, I like to go to bed, pull the covers over my head, lay there and suck my thumb and feel sorry for myself. And one day I came to realize that it's very depressing to act depressed. You know? <laughs> And, um, I, I turned my uh, concern about this over. I read a book today on page 86, something by you. Relax and take it easy. Don't worry. Let go. Let God pray for an in, intuitive thought or decision or an inspiration. And um, nothing's happened. Finally, today I got the answer. and says, yeah, that's right. It is a problem. <laughs> a big problem, but uh, but it's not your problem. And um, so I came to realize that uh, it's better if I put my efforts into keeping me comfortable than trying to make you comfortable. So if there's a problem about hearing a story, it's your problem, not mine. I love to, <laughs> I love to gather up people's problems. I've done that most of my life. So I come up with a problem, and think, oh, that's a terrific one. Can I have that? And I say, oh, yeah, you can have it. They go off happy and they what the hell am I going to do with this problem? You know? And I find I don't have to do that so much anymore. I can say, that's an interesting problem you got there. You just keep that and I'll do what I can to help you with it. But you keep it. I, uh, it's, it's a new thing I've learned on the program. So if this problem is yours, and I know that the new people uh, will be hearing me the first time and the people that have heard me before, I know we'll get a tremendous lesson in patience and tolerance. <laughs> so from there, we'll go on from there. I said it was an alcoholic, and I don't even know what an alcoholic is for everything. I was talking about how I uh, used to go to the Canyon Club on Saturday nights. Uh, and I, at that time, I wasn't even an alcoholic. I, I wouldn't want you to think I'd always been an alcoholic. I, uh, uh, I, I used to find myself accidentally drunk a lot, but I wasn't one of those dumb alcoholics. Uh, in fact, I didn't become an alcoholic until I'd been coming to these meetings for nine months. 
My Eleanor wife says it was seven months. <laughs> it was the end of July of uh, 1967 that I became an alcoholic. Up till then, I was uh, not an alcoholic. And uh, at least as I say, I used to find myself accidentally drunk when I was drinking, but I wasn't an alcoholic. And after seven months, I became an alcoholic. And now that I'm an alcoholic, I don't even drink. <laughs> And when I became an alcoholic, I was a very mild alcoholic at first. I've become a full-blown alcoholic since that time. But just alcoholic enough to stay here. I don't even know what an alcoholic is, for God's sake. I think uh, Jack came close to it today, saying that it had to do with endorphins and iodoisoquinolines and all that fancy brain chemistry. I think there's something wrong in the chemistry in my head. But when I say I'm an alcoholic... I mean that I can't drink safely, sanely, sensibly, socially. I can't drink for the dam, as a matter of fact. Uh, and yet I can't not drink. I have a body that doesn't, answer, doesn't handle alcohol appropriately. Uh, I don't, uh, and I don't have any problems with that. The fact that my body doesn't handle that chemical the way most other people do. Nine out of ten of the people who drink alcohol react to it one way. They're called social drinkers. A one out of ten reacts to it differently, and they're called alcoholics. I react to it differently than what's called an alcoholic. And I've seen that with every drug I've ever studied all my life. That's why drugs are on prescription. That's why I have to go to a doctor to get them. That's why they're out on the supermarket, because they're all dangerous. They all, everybody acts to the drugs the same, except for the people that act to them differently. <laughs> it's like aspirin. Anybody can take aspirin, except the people that can't. <laughs> used to be you get penicillin in shot form, and anybody could take penicillin shots, except the people who are allergic to it. You give somebody that's allergic uh, to a penicillin a shot of penicillin, give them a shot and turn around and they kneel down, they drop, they drop it on the floor behind you. Wow, he sure is sensitive to that stuff, isn't he? <laughs> Weak-willed son of a gun, isn't he? <laughs> No guts at all. Yeah. <laughs> Can't even take a shot like a man. Uh, that, uh, I don't have any problems with that. I react differently to it. And I, uh, I, my body reacts differently to alcohol. It just means you just don't drink it. I mean, if you, you know, if you, if you do the weird and peculiar things when you drink that I do when I drink, you probably decide to not drink it. If you can't drink like a gentleman, don't drink at all. If you can't drink like a lady, leave it alone. If, if you can't handle it, just don't drink it. You, you, know, you don't have to be very smart to figure that out. I, I figured that out many a time. <laughs> My body doesn't handle alcohol well. The best thing to do is don't drink it. I have a body that doesn't handle alcohol, so I don't drink it. That would be no problem, except I have a brain. <laughs> and I have a brain that insists on drinking. <laughs> so I have to drink, but I can't drink. And you can't drink, but you have to drink. That's a dilemma. What that means is that without AA, you're screwed. You know? <laughs> I was screwed for a long time. Didn't even know what the problem was. I uh, I found out that uh, I used to drink. Yeah, I, when I first came to AA, I thought the first thing you have to do is figure out why you drank. And I got to thinking about why I drank. And I, I thought the reasons why I drank. Like I, in the daytime, I drank uh, daytime drinks. And at night, I drank nightcaps. That's what nightcaps were invented for. And when it was hot, I drank when it was hot. You drink beer when it's hot. I remember going to ball games back in Ohio, and you always take a bottle because it gets cold. So I drank when it was hot, I drank when it was cold. I drank on happy occasions. Go to a wedding, you always drink. That's why people invite you to their wedding. Come to the wedding and drink. You can't not drink at a wedding. You insult it. You have to drink at a wedding. I think even remember my father's funeral. We drank at his funeral. In fact, I've never been to a funeral or awake that they didn't have liquor out in the kitchen. You drink it sad occasions. 
Well, I used to drink when there's a lot of people around. You have to drink when people are around. People are insulted if you don't drink with them when they're around. Uh, I used to drink when I was alone, because I was lonely. I would drink because it was there. I would find, uh, go to the refrigerator, just checking it out, see what's in the refrigerator. The bottle sitting on, here I am on the second shelf. You know. Oh, okay, I'll have a beer. You know. I just drink it because it was there. I go out and buy some because there wasn't any there. <laughs> Never know when somebody's going to come by. I drank a bit. Only thing I can do. Only thing that was consistent about it was that every drink I ever took seemed like a good idea at the time. May not have seemed like a good idea a short time later, but it seemed like a good idea at the time I drank it. And I, uh, I drank on all kinds of occasions. I, I remember drinking when I, uh, before I would go to church dinner dances. Uh, and I don't like church dinner dances. There are a lot of people at church dinner dances. So you have to talk to them. And I, I don't know how to talk to people at dinner. Uh, seemed to do all right tonight, but that was, uh, I didn't know how to do it then. And uh, I didn't know how to dance. I couldn't dance. Uh, I don't like to dance. Except when I would have a few drinks. I remember before going to a church dinner dance, I'd have a few drinks. You have to be very careful not to drink too much while you're there. You have to have two drinks while you're there. If you don't drink at all, people will know you have a problem. So you have to drink, but you have to not drink too much. Anybody knows that. Uh, And I would have two drinks before I went there and two drinks while I was there, and it would relax me mentally and physically. It relaxed me mentally, and I could talk to people. It relaxed me physically, and I could dance. And a few drinks, it relaxed me mentally. I talked, 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 and it relaxed me physically. I could dance. uh, But as time went by, I can recall, this is many years ago, I have to think back to it, but as time went by, the two got out of sync. I would, um, for instance, I would not have even begun to relax mentally yet, and I would get too relaxed physically. <laughs> and I would have to talk, it would show up in my voice, and I would have to talk very slowly and carefully so nobody would notice. And uh, when I would reach for something to knock it down, or I would trip, and I would, when there was nothing to trip on, I would. Uh, or I would find myself lying there on the floor, and my brain would say, Get up, you fool. These people will think you're drunk. You know? <laughs> and my body would say, What do you mean, get up? And I'm paralyzed from the ears down. You know? <laughs> and I lay there and think, isn't, isn't that strange? Isn't it strange that I can't move? <laughs> I don't remember reading about that in medical school. I, just, um, I must have an idiosyncrasy to alcohol. I'll have to look up, look that up someday. Being of scientific bend, it uh, didn't help me get sober, but it gave me something to think about uh, while I was laying. Took my mind off a little bit, off my full bladder, and, uh, and that's not a good time to have a full bladder. And then there are times when the opposite would happen, and I wouldn't have even begun to relax physically yet, and I would get too relaxed mentally. It would be like, uh, as if all my brain cells would get together and say, Ah, what the hell, he's drinking anyhow. Let's take the night off. (laughs) And they'd go on home. (laughs) And my body would go on doing things. And in the morning, I tried to figure out what my body had been doing when my brain was gone. <laughs> I used to worry about that. Until one night I heard uh, Cliff Barr talk about, uh, he came out, He used to worry about what he did in blackouts until he one day remember, realized that he'd never come out of a blackout to find that he had spent the night helping the little sisters of the poor. <laughs> So I no longer try to figure out what I was doing 
when my brain didn't stay on duty to record what was happening at the time. And there were other times when both mental and physical got... What happened was the longer I drank, the harder it was to predict what was going to happen when I drank. And um, my life continued to deteriorate, and um, I ended up in the um, nut ward. I ended up in the nut ward of the hospital I was on the staff of. <laughs> the, uh, and I remember being admitted there, and uh, they wanted to put me in a uh, ward, because that's part of the therapy that you mixed in with the other kooks, and uh, it's good for you. It's the same, so they have all kinds of weird ideas there. Just like they try to convince me that the quality of my life would be improved if I could learn how to make leather belts. <laughs> that made no sense to me that, that any my life would be improved in any way by me knowing how to make leather belts. Uh, but it is true that after going to these meetings for a little while, I went back to that hospital and I made a beautiful pair of moccasins. <laughs> I made a pair of moccasins and a half a wallet. <laughs> and I just love my moccasins. They were, <laughs> I wish I had brought them. I wish, you, I, wish I could try. You'd, you'd be impressed. Uh, for the workmanship and the, and the leather was good and the, they, uh, they not only fit good but they wore good they wore really good so they would, the tongs wear out and I'd repair them and replace them and it took seven years before they wore out to the point where I couldn't repair them anymore and um, for my seventh AA birthday my dear Alanon wife had my moccasins bronze <laughs> and I just loved my bronze moccasins so they're not nearly as comfortable as they <laughs> But I love them, and as long as I remember where they came from, I won't have to go back and make another pair. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, I didn't like it in a nut ward. And the other thing they do with you there is they give you a lot of pills. And then they say, now we want you to go outside and play volleyball. <laughs> and the boys are going to play the girls. Here, take your Thor's team. <laughs> and Thor's team uh, makes light seem brighter. And feet seem heavier. And it's hard to get a message from your head to your feet. And... Uh, <laughs> One of the girls that hit the ball. Here it comes. <laughs> you gotta run, Paul. Oh. <laughs> Here comes that concrete wall, Paul. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> well, volleyball in a concrete block wall court is a painful game, I'll tell you. <laughs> shouldn't do that. I was thinking about that volleyball going by. It reminded me of uh, Demerol. I don't know why it reminded me. I have to be careful about... Uh, I, I only took alcohol. I used a few pills, too, and a few narcotics. I didn't... But I, I just took enough... Pill. I, didn't, I never became a pill head. I just took a few medicinal, non-habit forming medicinal pills. No, no, that's true. That's true. I never, ever took a pill. I never ever took a pill, except when I had the symptom that only that pill would relieve. I did. I, I either had it or I could feel it coming on. <laughs> they were very tiny little pills. You know? And I was rather insensitive to pills. I took more. And I took a few narcotics. And I, I took, uh, as I was, had mentioned earlier, I was some Demerol. I had, I had to be careful when I mentioned Demerol, though, because the other night I mentioned this at the meeting. And my mind went blank for about 30 seconds. And I, just, you know, uh, and it, even, it didn't make my nose itch like morphine does. But morphine is hard to practice good medicine when you shoot morphine. You have to do everything with one hand, scratch your nose with the other. And, uh, have a tendency to vomit unexpectedly. And, uh, patients never got used to that. And, uh, <laughs> uh, 
But when you get admitted to the nut ward of the hospital you're on your staff of and your wife takes you in, you get a private room. Because she says, do you realize that he's on the staff of this hospital? <laughs> and I got a private room. It, was, it wasn't really private. It was kind of like the room. She was talking uh, today and she was talking about the day I had the convulsion and they took me, she took me to the hospital and I wouldn't stay unless she stayed overnight in the bed next to me in the same room. Here I am, big shot doctor on the staff of this hospital, and I won't stay until mommy has the bed next to me. And when I went to the ward, she didn't want to stay there. And, and, as a matter of fact, I got out of the ward after about 30 days, and I went home and I said, that was pretty nice. That, that, that maybe you'd like to go in for a little while. <laughs> she was insulted. I, Actually, I thought I was rather heroic because I knew she was the one that needed it, and yet I, I didn't want to tell them that. I'd already signed out of the Mayo Clinic, and I was, whatever. And they obviously had locked up the wrong person. I knew she was my problem. Uh, she had my wife could drink, too, was my opinion. And um, she knew I was her problem. We were like cross swords. And uh, the harder I worked on her, the sicker she got. And the harder she worked on me, the sicker I got. This guy, and I worked, man. I did all kinds of things. I thought, uh, I thought hypnosis might help her. Hmm? Hypnotherapy, they called it. I took a course in hypnosis. <laughs> Turned out she wasn't a very good hypnotic subject. I didn't give up. I, ended, I, I took six different courses in hypnosis, trying to hypnotize her. I ended up a drunken hypnotist. <laughs> saying, hip, saying hypnotherapy reminded me of uh, the time before I became an alcoholic and I was looking for answers. There was uh, something in some of the medical journals about carbon dioxide inhalations being good treatment for uh, uh, emotional problems, psychoneuroses. And um, the more I read about it, the more I thought, that sounds good, that sounds like what you, if you breathe carbon dioxide, the more you breathe of it, the deeper you breathe. And you keep getting it in your bloodstream, and it makes you breathe deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, until so you finally pass out. I thought, I could do that. <laughs> so I got out the other page of the phone book, and I found a place where they sell oxygen by the tank, and then they also sold, car I called, and I said, they, they sold carbon dioxide by the tank. So I said, send me a tank. <laughs> brought it to the house. Great big tank of carbon dioxide. Big thing, but so big around. Brought it in on the cart, set it in the bedroom, of course, <laughs> with hoses and a mask on it. And every night I'd go in, and I'd go in the living room, and say to Max, I'm going in, take my treatment. You come in later and take the mask off. <laughs> I go in, lie on the bed, cross my arms, put the mask on my face, turn the thing on, and breathe deeper, 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 pass out. And later on, she'd wander in and say, Oh, you know, take the mask off, you know. That's, it didn't work, I must say. It didn't, didn't, didn't get me sober, but I, I was willing to go to any length, I'll tell you. I wanted to get well, and I was willing to do just anything at all. Like so many people who talk to me, I'm willing to do anything. Uh, I said, what about quitting drinking? Well, no, they're not ready to do that. Yeah, I said, what, well, how about going to AA? Well, no, what else you got? You know, and, but uh, I was trying hard. And I, um, uh, I was sent to AA. The harder the, the, the um, worse things got, the harder it was for me to control my drinking, the harder I tried to control everything and everybody. I was really fighting for control. Really fight. I was trying to control everything, everything, everybody, all the aspects of my life. See, I was totally in charge of my life, totally in charge. Uh, the, uh, and when you're in charge, you get credit for everything good that's happened, but you also have to take the blame for everything bad, unless you can blame it on somebody. Like Max. And, and, uh, if there's somebody around, you can blame it on. And uh, I used to spend my time in the nut ward thinking of the things that had gone wrong that a nice guy like me ended up in a place like that. And, uh, and I remember one day I was sitting there uh, thinking of all the things that had gone wrong when uh, this dumb psychiatrist who couldn't see that Max was my problem walked up behind me and says, How would I like to talk to a man from AA? 
And I thought, God Almighty, don't I have enough problems of my own without trying to help some drunk from AA? You know? <laughs> I was spending my time sitting there writing letters and orders and directions and things for Max to do to try to keep the world running while I was locked up in that way. And that alone was enough of a job. And uh, I think, of course, today I realize that's kind of crazy for me to do that from the network. But, of course, it's not as crazy as her coming back every day for a new list like she did. Then I ended up going to some AA meetings just to please this dumb psychiatrist. Um, I don't know if you, I'm sure none of you have ever been in the nut ward, but happiness, ha 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 yourself. Uh, <laughs> happiness on the nut ward is having a happy psychiatrist. And I agreed to go and we went and got to some of these meetings and I heard some dumb things. And I remember a guy stood up there and said, uh, Big husky, big husky, healthy guy. He says, for me to drink is to die. And I thought, oh my God, how corny can you get? Here, you're just trying to frighten, at, here I was, I had pancreatitis once, I had convulsions twice, I thought I was dying from a brain tumor, I was on pass from the nut ward, and I thought you were trying to frighten me into joining this organization. And, and, and I remember the day I heard a guy say, if I don't drink today, I'm a success today. And I was ashamed for him. <laughs> what kind of life would that be that you could brag about the fact you hadn't had a drink today, hadn't had a beer today? And, you, and, and the people in AA seem like such fanatics. Really fanatics. Even beer and light wine, for God's sake. <laughs> That's what I drank when I quit drinking. <laughs> and their own lingo and everything else. But there were two things that were said after several months that really, and they were said close together, and I think they had a tremendous impact And the fact that they were said close together. I think it was very important. One of them was, the guy said, I'd rather be an AA by mistake than out there by mistake. I'd rather be an AA by mistake than out there by mistake. And that has, been an, has influenced me ever since. And to this day, I love to hear drunk alongs. I'm fascinated by what are the, this disease does to nice people like us. Both us with the allergy and the compulsion and those who live with us who have it. It's, a, it's fascinating. Fascinating. What alcohol, it's the most fascinating disease I've ever studied. And I've studied a lot of diseases. My background is internal medicine. And I've studied Tsutsukamuchi fever and Kwashi Orkor. <laughs> Things I don't even care if I ever see anymore, you know. And, and none as fascinating as alcoholism. And nothing's more fascinating in this disease than the recoveries. Fascinating recoveries. I just love to watch people come in and get well and play a part, any kind of a part in somebody else's recovery from this disease. It's a really fa- most fascinating disease, fascinating recovery I've ever seen. And I love it. Just love it. And I... Uh, I was, uh, what was the other thing that, uh, whether it be an AA by mistake? Oh, yeah, thank you, Max. Uh, <laughs> no, she's heard this story as often as I have. Because <laughs> she comes with me. Uh, we go to these things all the time together. And as a matter of fact, I'm very indebted to Max, very, 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 very indebted to Max for her, uh, I find it's choking me up a bit, for her enthusiasm for the program. Because there was the time early, in the early days, before I became an alcoholic, when I would punish her for not acting right by refusing to go to meetings, knowing that she couldn't drive all the way to Laguna by herself. And she got in the car and drove to the Guna Beach all by herself repeatedly. And so I decided, well, the hell with that. Then I used to start going back. And, the and many a time I'll decide, oh, no, I don't want to do that. And she'll say, oh, come on, let's go to the meeting. That person would be happy to have us there 
to see hear him speak or something like that. And um, I'm very appreciative of Max's interest in the program. It's, every alcoholic should have an enthusiastic Al-Anon in their life. Uh, the, um, but anyway, what the person said was that uh, they, so they were speaking of themselves, and they said, I was judging me by my intentions, and the world was judging me by my actions. And I was, I was just very, very sorry they said that. I, <laughs> But I'm really one of the best intentioned people you'll ever meet. You know, they just don't come much better intentioned than I am. I, in all humility, I will tell you that. Uh, uh, but when I set all my intentions aside and just looked at my actions, it was a very painful thing. I was a drunken father, drunken husband, drunken neighbor, drunken drunken doctor, for God's sake. It's never intended. And uh, as I say, after seven months, I became... An alcoholic and haven't had a drink since and find it amazingly easy to not drink. It just amazes me how easy it is to not drink, take pills, shoot drugs. Uh, and I, um, of course, I stay very active, but it's very easy to not do those things. Not drinking is no problem for me. On the other hand, not thinking tends to be a problem. So, any problem I have today is a thinking problem. And if I think it's a problem, it's a problem. Whether you think it's a problem or not, it's a problem. In fact, if I think it's a big problem, it's a big problem. I, and that's the nice part about it. I decide the size of my problem. I didn't know that. Everybody else used to decide it for me. Uh, the authorities and the press and politicians and that would tell me how big my problems were. And today, I realize I decide whether or not my problems are, how big they are and whether or not they are problems. And I... Uh, I have never thought I had a, a problem and been wrong. <laughs> you want me to wait for you? I'll wait. <laughs> if, if, it, if it seems like a problem to me, it is. And, that, and in, fact, in fact, I haven't done it recently, but I used to read the 20 questions and substitute thinking for drinking. Uh, I'd like to do that tonight if I have the uh, 20 questions with me. I think it might be good for the... Uh, Alanon. Uh, I heard Gene say this morning that uh, an Alanon thinking might be worse than an alcoholic drinking. You know? and, um, but the, if you take the 20 questions and substitute thinking for drinking, you get questions like, do you lose time from work due to your thinking? Or really dumb questions like, is your thinking making your home life unhappy? <laughs> Do you think because you are shy with other people? Is your thinking affecting your reputation? <laughs> Have you ever gone into financial difficulty as a result of thinking? <laughs> Do you crave a think at a definite time daily? <laughs> Do you want to think the next morning? <laughs> Is thinking causing you to have difficulty in sleeping? <laughs> Many a night my body won't lie down, go to sleep, my brain would say, no, no, let's lay here and talk about it for a while. <laughs> or even in the middle of the night, say, hey, wake up, we want to talk to you. <laughs> you know that thing you think you thought you handled so well today? wasn't like that at all. You know? <laughs> They're really ticked off at you. Okay. And you did the same thing last year. And the year before that. In fact, you don't want to do your fourth step. Let's stay here and do this the rest of the night. We'll take your inventory for you. <laughs> Ask your questions that have no answers. <laughs> Is your thinking jeopardizing your job or business? Do you think to escape from worries or trouble? <laughs> Do you think alone? <laughs> the, uh, has your physician ever treated you or have you ever been in a hospital or institution on account of your thinking? <laughs> and 
reasons why I like this is the one that says, have you ever had a complete loss of memory as a result of thinking? <laughs> I, uh, I shouldn't have really have said my name is Paul and I'm an alcoholic. I should have said my name is Paul and we are alcoholics. <laughs> My uh, my head is a very busy place, uh, as I've often said. It's uh, people say that anything run by a committee isn't very well run. My life has been run by a committee with no chairman. <laughs> you know, it's more like a like I said earlier, like a crowded greyhound tourist bus yeah, with a, with no driver. Yeah, and, and one of the passengers would get up and drive a while, you know. And they'd sit down and somebody else would drive a while. And we wonder why we never got there. You know. A very busy place. And all talking. I have personalities I haven't even used yet. <laughs> and, they've, uh, and they all talk. Talk, 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 talk. Huh? I don't know how you think, but... My think by people talking. Talk, 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 all the time. Talk, 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 day and night. Talk, 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 like a radio talk show. And sometimes drift over and pick up another one. Talk, 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 talk. All the time talking. All these personalities. And uh, one of them doesn't like Max. She's <laughs> always pointing out things that she said. So did you hear what she just said? You say, what kind of a man would put up with a woman talking about about him like that? You know, and uh, yet there's another one up there who thinks she's absolutely fantastic. Thinks she's beautiful and charming and great sense of humor and wonderful person. All these con- conflicting things. There's one in my head that's afraid. All the time afraid. So don't do that. Don't do that. You'll make a fool of yourself and they'll all laugh at you. There's one that says, as long as you're sober, buddy, you can do anything. You can do just anything. There's just nothing you can't do. The different personalities, each one has their own pat way of doing it. There's one up there, no matter what happens, his answer is always the same. Let's have a drink. You know? <laughs> Every time he said that, we all marched off and had a drink. <laughs> Today I found out I don't have to do everything that, that's suggested. Those are, those are not orders. I thought they were, but they're just suggestions. It's like, like an AA meeting. Anybody can say anything they want. I say, well, thank you for participating. Now, if you'll sit down, we'll call on somebody else. And then we'll all decide what to do. We'll have a consensus. I used to uh, drown them out. That was the only way I could, the only way I could handle them was to use drugs, chemicals, alcohol, and pills to silence them, put them all to sleep so I could go to sleep. I, I didn't have a drinking problem. I had a sleeping problem. I was born with congenital insomnia, <laughs> and I had, to, I, had to, I had to get to sleep. I had important things to do, and it was necessary that I sleep. And uh, I. Uh, I have to drink. I'm, uh, I find that I can't do that for a variety of reasons. Every every time I use a drug or a chemical of any sort, it created a need for still another chemical. There's always a side effect. It always worked. Every chemical always worked, but then it always worked for a shorter and shorter period of time. And it took more and more to do it. So I had to take more of it, take it more often, and I had to take something new to counteract that. And every time I used a drug to solve a problem, it made me more dependent on drugs to solve a problem. But every time I used AA and the AA program to solve a problem, I become more dependent on AA. Every time I use spiritual values, which is the same thing, I become more dependent on spiritual values. So I'm not less dependent, I'm more dependent, but they're on spiritual values on this program. I came to this program and looked for an answer eventually for how to take care of a drinking problem, and I found an answer that fits every problem I've ever had. And I've become aware of the fact that uh, one of the worst things I can do with a problem is what I used to do to work on it. I don't even have to work on it, all I have to do is think about it. I just have a powerful mind that puts, puts energy into whatever I think about it. Good or bad. 
And if I put, if I think about my problem, all I do is watch it grow. I just make any problem, and I can make it bigger. I can think of, I can take a non-problem. And I said, well, that's no problem. Anybody could see that. But if you, if you think about it a minute, it could be. You know. <laughs> Pretty soon I'm thinking, well, you know, it is kind of a problem. So I look at it, it, you know, it, it is. A bit. And pretty soon I'm thinking, my God, it's a good thing I'm looking at this problem. It really is. I'm the only one that's noticing that it's a problem. You know. and, and pretty soon I'm thinking, my God, what am I going to do with this God darn problem? And people aren't able to help you with a problem like that very much. I mean, I haven't been able to find help. Even my sponsor, terrific guy, Jack, Jack Ken in L.A., great guy. But he has this dumb expression. He says, well, whatever. <laughs> what are you going to do with a, a well, whatever, when you've got a great big problem? I remember one time I was the, I used to I used to think you know my my um, good intentions. I was always planning to do much more with my life than I had done, and I would have done it if it hadn't been for circumstances like the wrong parents born in the wrong town, the wrong time. My father was a pharmacist instead of a doctor, and I married Max, and Max did all these things. And uh, I used to call Jack up and tell him all these reasons why I wasn't doing more with my life than I was. I thought he needed to know that. And uh, he used to listen to this. But one day, I called him up to tell him this something that Max had done that was real awful that I can't remember at the moment. And, uh, and before I could even get it get started, he interrupted me, and he said something about, uh, well, why don't you just... Why don't you just put it out of your mind a couple of days and see what happens? And I said, okay, Jack. I said, Jack, a couple of days? I'll forget all about it. <laughs> and I can't, uh, and I can't use drugs to silence the voices in my head anymore. One of the main reasons, too, is that that's where I hear where God speaks to me. God speaks to me as one of the voices in my head. And I have to listen to all of them to tell which one he is. God comes to me in spiritual ideas. Or ideas of love. Or how to help a newcomer. How to help somebody on the program. How to help somebody needs to be on the program. How to help somebody not on the program. Um, he comes to me in ideas. And um, both the voices in my head and the voices in AA. And I have to listen to AA because that's where I hear God speak. And I, I'm never sure when he's speaking and when he isn't. And sometimes I think he's speaking through everybody. And so I have to listen to ten of them. I can't stop coming here and I can't turn off the voices in my head. And that's where I hear God. And of all the people in my head, of all the personalities, inside me it's my belief that deep in the very center deep 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 in the very center there's a center of calm there's a center of calm in the very center of my being and that's where God is as uh, Tom was talking about the first on Friday night um the center of calm in the center. If he's, and if, if that's where God is, and I think I think that's where he is, if that's where he is in me, then that's where he is in you. That's where he is in all of us. And I've often heard it said that we are all equal. And yet, we obviously aren't equal in many, many things. But yet, I wonder... I wonder if that isn't where our equality is. That God is in the center of each of us and we each have the same spiritual potential. I wonder if that isn't true. I, I choose to think it is. I remember one day hearing Chuck C. talk and he was talking about his higher power did this and his higher power did that and all the time his higher power doing all these wonderful things. And after he was through, when I talked to him later in the day, and I said, you know, you're all the time bragging about your higher power. And I just bet you a nickel, and I'll make it a quarter. I'll bet a quarter in a fair fight, my higher power could lick your higher power. <laughs> I just wonder if we couldn't all have the same equality. I, uh, 
We, it's interesting uh, to think in terms of we are each one of us is unique. No two of us are the same. No two of us are the same. Like snowflakes, and there are no two living things are exactly the same. And so God has gone to a lot of trouble to make us unique, which means that if if any one of us was missing, we the universe wouldn't be complete. Uh, God went to a lot of trouble to create us unique, and yet with all that same spiritual potential, I think of God as the uh, the, the Bible tells us he went to he created all this in what was it eight days and on the seventh day he rested <laughs> the six days make it that's shameful and, I never was good in arithmetic I, I just want to see if you're listening yeah. And, yeah, and, uh, but the point is I think that on the eighth day was what I was going to say on the eighth day I think he went back to work and he's been creating ever since that he um and in fact, this, uh, my understanding is that the firmament is expanding outward in all directions at the speed of light. It's having to make room for new stars, new uh, universes. He's like and making more people all the time. Well, and more and more on that. Talk about a workaholic. He must really like what he's doing. You know? <laughs> making all the stuff and having to make room for it. And he creates reality. I heard it said that somebody paraphrase the Koran or Koran as saying that um, the only God is reality and I thought yeah, that sounds very atheistic and yet uh, God creates reality and I wonder if it isn't true that to the extent that we accept reality to that extent we accept God or at least the manifestation of God, just as each of us is the manifestation of God. You can't accept God and not accept this reality. It seems to me. And I, uh, the acceptance was such an important thing for me in my sobriety that when I first came here, I admitted I was an alcoholic. I did that just because it made you happy. My name is Paul, and I'm an alcoholic. You say, "Oh, wonderful!" Back, 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 back. Anything to please these people, you know. Uh, the people please it from way back. and uh, But I didn't believe it. I admitted it, but I didn't accept it. And uh, the day came seven months later when I accepted the fact that I, of all people, even though I had no choice in the matter, had not ever thought it was a good idea, and still didn't think it was a good idea, I accepted the fact that I am, apparently it's your mistake, I am a mild alcoholic. <laughs> And the question is now, what are we going to do about it? And I haven't had a drink since that day. And I think the reason is that I stopped living in the problem and started living in the answer. And I've stayed in the answer ever since. And the answer is here. And I, I accepted the challenge of being an alcoholic and being comfortable anyway. So I think that's what we do when we accept. We accept the challenge. Yeah, that's reality. That's the way it is. Now, can I accept that... It being that way and still be comfortable anyhow. And I, am I willing to play the role of hero in my own life story instead of victim? I've always loved to be the victim. As long as I knew who to blame. And, uh, but it's more fun to be the hero. There's much more to do. I accept the challenge of uh, facing life on life's terms. I, somebody once said they had asked somebody asked a famous golfer the secret of his success and his fame and he said it was just one rule that he had always played the ball from where it was rather than from where he wished it was play the ball where it lies and um now, I guess that's what life is all about. Uh, it's, I guess we'd call it the law of non-resistance. That life is not painful, it's our resistance to life that's painful. Like the bumper sticker on the car when we pulled up the register the other night. It says, pain, yet pain is optional. It helped me to realize that 
Acceptance is not necessarily approval. You don't, I don't have to approve of it to accept it. The, um, I remember talking one time to a woman. Uh, I was saying that the, the thing about uh, pain, life is not painful, it's our resistance to life is painful. And she said she couldn't accept that. That she had a uh, son, teenage son, who had, uh, was paraplegic following a motorcycle accident when he was drinking. And she couldn't accept that. Couldn't. And I pointed out that uh, I had heard that it didn't necessarily have to approve of it to accept it. And I saw her some weeks later, and she said that it helped her a great deal because she was now able to accept it, even though she didn't approve that it had happened, and she was much happier. And her peace and joy was being reflected in her son's improved mental attitude he was picking it up for her and even though she didn't approve she was able to accept it it, um, and it seems to me that that's that's our that's kind of the game we play here can we accept reality on reality's terms and still be comfortable in spite of it I'm fascinated by many lines in the book one of them is it says that uh, our past becomes our most prized possession and it amazes me when I stand and talk to a crowd like this and I think of the years I spent trying to hide myself and my drinking and all the things I didn't like about me and um, because I thought if they ever became known I'd be ruined and now I stand up and tell everything that's bad about me I can think of <laughs> and people don't hate me and they love me more for it there's nothing and it's nice to have the feeling that there's nothing about me that I don't like that somebody in AA doesn't know because I told them I have no secrets that I'm aware of and I, I like that I, uh, I like the line in the book that says, uh, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. We absolutely insist on enjoying life. And I think God expects us to enjoy life. I think he's gone to a lot of trouble to give us everything we need to enjoy life. He's gone to a lot of trouble. And I think when we get wherever we're going, he may ask us whether we've been good or bad, but I think he's going to ask us, did you enjoy it down there? And if you say, well, not really. <laughs> These guys will say, well, if you didn't like it down there, you probably won't like it up here, so you can go to the devil. Yeah. <laughs> and the moral of the story is you better enjoy it whether you like it or not. <laughs> anyway, I... Uh, I'm real glad to be sober tonight. I, Max and I used to work on each other, trying to get each other straightened out. We kept making the thing worse, like two cross swords. In the day, she has her program and I have mine. And it's like Elsa C says, it's like two railroad tracks, separately but together. Separately but together, with all those ties holding us together. And it just keeps getting better and better. My relationship with her keeps improving. My relationship with myself keeps improving. I, I like me today better than I've ever liked me in my life. Uh, I esteem me. I approve of me. And that's, that's a real nice feeling. And I think, I think, I feel sure that that makes God happy. I think he likes for me to like me and for you to like you. And even my defects of character, I... Uh, I, that's something I accept. That's, I've had, it's, one, it's one thing for me to accept you and others, but it's for me to, on a consistent basis, for me to accept myself and my defects. What I've had to do with my defects a lot of times is like fear or depression. I want to tell God, you know, I, I'm sick of having this. This has been controlling my life, all my life, and I'm, I'm sick of it. I'm through it. I don't want it anymore. Take it away. I don't want to be bothered with it. I want it removed completely, entirely now. And, but I know that uh, you don't often necessarily work that way. And the seventh step prayer says, we remove from me every single defect of your character which you find uh, useful to, unless you find useful to you or my fellows. And so I would tell God, you take this away, take it away completely, but even if you don't want to, sleep on it all night. <laughs> and in the morning, you give it back to me the amount you want me to have. 
and whatever amount you give me, I'll know that somehow that's a gift from you. And I'll accept that and go on. And I've never done that. I've never done that that he's removed anything completely. But I've never done it that he hasn't removed a great deal of it. And what's left is somehow more acceptable to me. And I can accept me. I find that there's a lot of good in me and a lot of bad. But I'm better off if I focus more on the good than I used to. I used to be focused entirely on the bad. I find there's nobody in AA that I've ever met that is so bad that there isn't a lot of good in them. And I haven't focused on anybody that's so good there isn't some bad in them. And that's true of every situation, in person, place, thing, or situation. I can either look at the good or the bad. It's called the law of appreciation. And um, so I enjoy staying sober in this program. I enjoy being here tonight, doing being part of this. Tomorrow is Easter Sunday. The resurrection of Christ will be celebrated throughout much of the world. Uh, that's tomorrow morning. Tonight, as I see it, we celebrate our own resurrection. It's a tremendous resurrection that we have from where we've been. Resurrection really from the dead and dying. It's great to be alive in this, in this way of life. I, um, some people don't have a higher power, or they don't have a comfortable relationship with a higher power. To them, I offer them my higher power. I he had a lot of free time because I used to give him lists of things to do <laughs> and lists of things to not let happen and I don't do that anymore so he has a lot of free time and he doesn't handle it all that well <laughs> so I rent them out and rent free and if you have a higher don't have a higher power or have one you're not getting along well with together use mine just tell him I sent you and, <laughs> and uh, you may find you get along it's kind of like if you're I gave you a checkbook and said there's a million dollars in the bank and all you have to do is write checks for it. You might think, well, that's kind of stupid. That wouldn't work. You'd be right. You'd be right. If you didn't write any checks, you wouldn't get any money. But the more checks you wrote, the more money you'd have. And that's the way this program is. You do it and you get it. So I hope you all have a terrific Easter. I hope you come back tomorrow morning and hear uh, Sister B tomorrow morning. If you don't, it's going to be one of those meetings that people will tell you, you should have been there. So don't miss it. And um, I'm happy to be sober tonight. And I'm, I'm happy to be a sober alcoholic. I'm even ha- happy to be an alcoholic in the sense that I'd never have this if I hadn't been an alcoholic. I, I'm, I say I'm happy to be an alcoholic. I'm not saying I'm proud to be an alcoholic because I don't know that I had anything to do with being an alcoholic. You may say, well, you drank too much. That's how you got to be an alcoholic. I don't accept that. I don't accept that as a reason. I know it's used, spoken of commonly, but I don't know that I became an alcoholic because I drank too much. I think maybe I drank too much because I was alcoholic. I understand that alcoholics have a tendency to do that. <laughs> so I don't know how I became an alcoholic. I just know that I am one, and uh, I'm neither proud, I'm certainly not ashamed to be an alcoholic, uh, but I am very proud. I am very proud indeed. It's the most, the proudest thing in my life that I am a sober, comfortable, happy member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think that is absolutely fantastic and I just love it. I thank God for AA and I thank you for my sobriety. Happy Easter. <laughs>